please join me in welcoming to the Distinctive Voices podium, Dr. Giles Oldroyd. Thank you, Jennifer. And it's a pleasure to be here uh, and uh, a pleasure to join, join those online as well. So I'm going to talk today about my science on uh, driving sustainable productivity in agriculture. Uh, and then in the, in the last part of my talk, I'm going to be talking also about diversity of sciences. I hope that's not a, a surprise. So I would say I'm somewhat concerned about the state of our planet over the future decades. We, uh, as humans, are treating our natural resources as if, as if they are unlimited uh, and behaving in a way that our actions on the planet has no consequences on the services that, that we as a society and, and as a species depend. And when we look at many of the planetary services on which we are, which we, uh, so, so, which are so significant to our survival on this planet, we are operating outside what's considered the safe operating space in, in many of those planetary services. We hear an awful lot about climate change uh, and the impacts we have on the carbon cycle, but that is just one of many factors that we are impacting very negatively on the planet. And today I want to talk about our impact on these biogeochemical cycles, the cycles of phosphorus and nitrogen, uh, of which we impact very significantly from our agricultural practices. Now, that is the situation where we're currently standing with a population of around 7 billion on the planet. And during my lifetime, I've seen a massive, or we've all seen a massive expansion in the global population driven principally by an expansion in the population of Asia. It's predicted that you were going to experience a very significant or similar significant expansion in the population of, Af of Africa that is predicted to quadruple over the next 70 years. Uh, and this is going to put constraints and challenges on a, on a continent that's already struggling very significantly. Now, when we think about accommodating this expanding population, but also accommodating a very uh, significantly expanding middle class that demands much, much more uh, resource-dependent uh, uh, diets, we have to really consider how we grow our, the food that's going to support such a large uh, and demanding population. Now, I would say we sit at a juncture in, in our food production systems. Currently, our food production systems are uh, performing in, with, with regards to creating a, a high degree of food production, but they come with very significant environmental consequences. So we see sizable greenhouse gas emissions, significant biodiversity loss, uh, unsustainable water withdrawals and water pollution, all uh, con as a result of our environment, of our agricultural actions. We would like to be closer to this kind of analysis where we've got a secure and sustainable food production system with a much uh, more reduced environmental footprint. How we get there, uh, I think, is, is, is a, a challenge, and particularly how we do so under a period of uh, global climate change is going to be certainly an interesting few decades. So when we think about plant nutrition <clears throat> and how plants grow, it's profoundly different to we as humans. Um, plants are, uh, uh, utilize the energy of sunlight to drive photosynthesis, that allows the capture of carbon from the atmosphere uh, in the form of carbon dioxide that is then fixed into uh, forms of carbon that we can be integrated into sugars, amino acids, and nucleotides, et cetera. Now, uh, in contrast to this fixation of carbon from the atmosphere, plants are dependent on getting sources of phosphorus and nitrogen and water from the soil that surrounds them. And, and these, are, these elements really are the key building blocks of life. They form the, 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 the elemental ingredients of uh, sugars, amino acids, nucleotides that, that build all of the biological molecules that we exist, that exist in our bodies. So whereas we consume plants and we break them down into these uh, basic commodities, plants are actually building those commodities essentially from the elemental nutrients surrounding them. 
Now, when we consider how plants are, are they're, they're certainly very effective and efficient at capturing carbon, they're less effective and efficient at capturing phosphorus and nitrogen. And it's the availability of these nutrients in the soil surrounding them that can really limit plant productivity. Now, as a result of this, during the Green Revolution that really happened around the 1960s, we started to apply these nutrients at high concentrations in our agricultural systems. Uh, so, in the form of inorganic fertilizers, we apply phosphate and ammonium and nitrate that underpins crop production. And the Green Revolution was a profoundly important development in, 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 in our human society. It allowed a massive expansion in that particularly our cereal crops, maize, rice, and wheat, that create the staples of our food production systems. And, and in fact, since the Green Revolution, we've seen almost a tripling or quadrupling of those uh, productivity gains in, the, in those cereal crops, principally as a result, or largely as a result of our use of these inorganic fertilizers. So very much our food production systems, certainly in high income countries, are highly dependent on uh, the use of these inorganic fertilizers. And it really underpins uh, the population and our food security on which our populations depend. But the use of those inorganic fertilizers is extremely inefficient. Only a certain proportion, uh, well below 50% of those nutrients are actually captured by the crop plants on which are their targets. Much of those nutrients are getting out into the environment. Uh, one form is that they wash off through agricultural runoff into our uh, rivers and streams. And in these environments, they cause very uh, detrimental process of eutrophication. Uh, that, causes a collapse in the biodiversity of those aquatic ecosystems. We also see release of uh, an, uh, gaseous nitri nitrous species, nitrous and nitric, uh, nitric oxides that are produced as a result of microbial uh, processes that convert ammonia into these gaseous forms of nitrogen. Uh, and these gaseous forms of nitrogen are very potent greenhouse gases and also cause uh, uh, significant air pollution. They're the ingredients of smog. So while this use of these inorganic fertilizers really underpins our food production systems and is very important for feeding the planet, it comes with these very significant environmental consequences uh, and is the principal source of pollution that's coming out of our agricultural systems. So it's, it's, it's a very challenging system because in order to drive sustainability in the system, you have to reduce these uses or uh, use of these uh, fertilizers, but that uh, would have very significant impacts on our food production and our levels of productivity. Now, if we look at where nitrogen is produced and utilized around the planet, it's really restricted to uh, a lot of high-income countries. So you see the Corn Belt of the US, very significant uh, use of uh, inorganic fertilizers, nitrogenous fertilizers, Western Europe, the, the wheat production uh, regions of India uh, and, and large parts of China using large amounts of, inorg of these inorganic nitrogenous fertilizers. In contrast, smallholder farmers in sub-Saharan Africa really lack the resources to access these fertilizers and their use is very significantly reduced in, in sub-Saharan Africa. So we see their use principally around high-income countries, very little use in, in smallholder farming systems. Now, when you look at productivity, and here we're looking at maize production around the planet, so we're focusing really just on the maize producing areas of, of, of uh, the planet. If it's in green, it indicates that production is very high. You're achieving at least 50% of the potential productivity. And here in the US, you're close to 90% of the potential productivity for maize. So you're really hitting the ceiling of what you can uh, realistically produce uh, in your maize production. If it's red on this uh, graph, it means that productivity is limited by nutrients. If it's blue, it means that the maize productivity is limited by nutrients and water. So when we think about productivity in Africa, we often think about droughts and water available availability that's limiting productivity. In fact, much of the limitations of productivity in Africa is the access to these nutrients. It's a lack of access and application of nitrogen and phosphorus that limits the production of maize in large parts of sub-Saharan Africa. So for a 
smallholder farmer in, in, for instance, sub-Saharan Africa, access to these nutrients is really an issue of productivity. Their, their crops are underperforming, they're, 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 they are not getting the potential productivity because they lack access to these fertilizers. In a high-income country like uh, the US, for, uh, for instance, this is an issue of sustainability. Use and uh, excessive use of these fertilizers uh, really is driving pollution from agricultural systems. Um, so, but I'm interested in what we can do and the technologies that we can develop that would not only address the sustainability in high-income countries, but also ensure that any of those technological gains are getting to smallholder farmers and raising productivity for some of the poorest farmers on the planet. So, my research is really inspired by uh, uh, plants uh, the engagement with beneficial microorganisms. And this issue of access to nitrogen and phosphorus has been on the planet ever since plants have been around. They've had to find inventive ways and they've involved inventive ways to access these nutrients, nitrogen and phosphorus, and maximize their, their uptake from the environment surrounding them. So plants have learned to engage with beneficial fungi and with beneficial bacteria that aid, aid in the uptake of these nutrients from the surrounding environment. So uh, plants can form these very intimate and intricate associations with fungi that exist in the soil. Uh, these fungi co extensively colonize the plant roots and form these highly branched fungal intrusions into the plant cells that are called arbuscules. And up and down this root, that, fung that root will be heavily colonized by uh, the fungus, and in many of the root cortical cells will be able to harbor these fungal intrusions into uh, the plant cells. The fungus, in addition to highly colonizing the plant root, ramifies out into the surrounding environment and creates these very large hyphal networks out into the soil. And in so doing, they create an enormous surface area that whereby the plants can act, sorry, the fungus uh, can access nutrients from the surrounding soil. And you can see that the surface area, represented by this uh, root right here, is much smaller than the surface area that's covered by the fungal uh, hyphae growing through the soil. So what the fungus does is really massively expand the potential surface area of the plant root and allow the colonization of the soil at a level of complexity that the plant root alone is uh, incapable of doing. And so the fungus is able to, in this larger, much more uh, larger environment, uh, able to access uh, phosphate, nitrates, water, potassium, micronutrients, much more efficiently than the plant root can do. And it delivers those nutrients to the plant. Now, this association is beneficial. In exchange for the delivery of nitrates, phosphates, and water from the fungus, the plant provides, in exchange, a source of carbon, which the plant is very easily able to do using photosynthesis and the, the chemical fixation of carbon. So the plant is delivering sugars and lipids as a source of carbon to the fungus, and in exchange, the fungus is delivering phosphates and nitrates and other nutrients to the plant. Now, this association, we know, is extremely ancient, and it dates back, this engagement between the plant and the fungus, really dates back to the very, very earliest land plants. These very, very primitive land plants were colonizing the, the primordial earth from these aquatic ecosystems. So we know that the very early list land plants were, uh, if, if were starting to colonize Earth, from, sorry, the, the terrestrial landscape from these volcanic pools. So they existed as a, initially as aquatic plants thriving in these very nutrient-rich environments, these nutrient-rich uh, aquatic environments like these volcanic pools. And then they have to start to colonize the, to this terrestrial environment. When they move out of this aquatic environment to this terrestrial environment, they hit a number of challenges. They hit a challenge of managing water loss, and they also hit the challenge of how they get these essential nutrients from this very challenging terrestrial environment. This primordial earth didn't have soil. Soil is created by the breakdown of plant material. So when they're moving out into this terrestrial, primitive terrestrial uh, earth, they're actually colonizing rock 
and sand. Uh, it's a very challenging environment. And we know that these early primitive plants didn't have roots. What they had was the engagement with the fungus. So in these very early uh, land plants, it's actually the fungus that's for forming the function of the root and providing really the access to these nutrients from this. And the reason we know that is that there's some beautifully preserved fossils from the very earliest primitive land plants. And they're so well preserved that you can see these fungal intrusions that we call arbuscules into the cells of those very primitive land plants. So we know actually from the fossil record that these these uh, fungal associations already existed. Uh, and it actually, we, we can place the arbuscular mycorrhizal symbiosis, this beneficial fungal symbiosis, right at the root of the evolution of land plants. It predates the divergence of most of our plants. And we're looking here at a phylogenetic tree that shows the entire plant kingdom from liverworts and mosses through ferns, gymnosperms, and into the, the flowering plants, the angiosperms. Uh, and we can place the evolution of the arbuscular mycorrhizal symbiosis right at that very earliest stage as in the evolution of land plants. Uh, roots do not emerge until about here. So we've got about 100 million years of the plant's engagement with the fungus before roots actually evolve. Um, so because of that very, that very early evolution of the fungal association, in fact, the fungal association is pretty well ubiquitous in the plant kingdom. Most, most all plants have the ability to associate with this fungus, including a lot of our important crop plants. So our cereal crops, the rice and maize and wheat, are sitting here in the monocots. They engage very actively with our muscular mycorrhizal fungi. And most of our angiosperm crops uh, with a few exceptions, can engage with this beneficial fungus. So our cereal crops have the ability to engage with this beneficial fungus, but the trait itself has not been improved. There's been no intentional breeding or improvement of this engagement with the beneficial fungus to maximize its performance in an agricultural context. So while crop plants can engage with the fungus, I think there's a lot we can still do to maximize and improve that engagement with the fungus through intentional breeding or through engineering. <clears throat> Now, uh, the second association that I'm going to talk about today is, the, uh, is an association with nitrogen-fixing bacteria. And this evolved much, much later. So whereas the arbuscular mycorrhizal symbiosis is all the way down here, the uh, engagement with beneficial bacteria, the nitrogen-fixing bacteria, happened about 360 million years later. Uh, at, at about 80 million years ago, we see the emergence of this association with nitrogen-fixing bacteria. Uh, and then that ramifies out, and we see about 25% of the angiosperms sitting in what we call the nitrogen-fixing clade. Now, this engagement with beneficial bacteria or nitrogen-fixing bacteria, which we strongly associate with legumes, so that's peas and beans, soya bean as, as an example, widely grown here in the US. These are plants that can engage with these beneficial bacteria. And what the bacteria do, they have an enzyme called nitrogenase. And that enzyme has the ability to uniquely use what is a very widespread and very common form of nitrogen, and that's molecular dinitrogen. 70% of the air you're currently breathing is this molecule, molecular dinitrogen. It's two molecules of nitrogen with a triple bond. It's extremely chemically inert. It's one of the most chemically inert molecules on the planet. Very difficult to use. We breathe it in, we breathe it out. We can't use that form of nitrogen. Only bacteria that have this enzyme nitrogenase can use this form of nitrogen. And they convert that form of nitrogen into ammonia, which is now a reactive form of nitrogen that many organisms can use, including plants. And they incorporate that uh, ammonium into their amino acids and hence start to in integrate it into biological, their biological systems. So legumes and some other species are closely related species of plants have evolved this ability to associate with nitrogen fixing bacteria, which gives them access to this really unlimited source of uh, nitrogen out, out in the atmosphere. Now legumes create these unique structures on the roots that we call nodules. 
And these are structures that have evolved to accommodate the nitrogen-fixing bacteria. If you take a cross-section through a nodule, and this is a cross-section through a soybean nodule, you can see these are all the bacteria that are packed inside the cells of those nodules. They're surrounded by a plant-derived membrane. But you can see this colonized cell hugely, uh, extensively colonized by bacteria that are uh, sitting inside. And, and that's compared to here an uncolonized cell, just uh, for comparison. Now, these nodules are pink in coloration, and the reason they're pink in coloration is because they possess the, ho the, the, the protein hemoglobin. It's exactly the same protein that makes our red blood cells, and similar to hemoglobin's function in our red blood cells, it controls uh, the uh, movement of oxygen in these structures. And the reason the plant has to control oxygen is the enzyme nitrogenase is inhibited by oxygen. So it's very important to carefully control the levels of oxygen in these structures that maximizes the uh, activity of the enzyme nitrogenase uh, and allows this process of nitrogen fixation. So the bacteria, the, so the, sorry, the plant creates these unique uh, structures that house the bacteria and in a similar manner to what I described for the fungal association, the plant delivers carbon in the form of uh, sugars uh, that it feeds to the bacteria, and in exchange, the, the bacteria deliver uh, 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 nitrogen to the plant. So for a legume, a legume crop like soybean, it, it has the ability to acquire pretty well all of its nutrients through these uh, microbial associations, getting phosphates, nitrates, and water through the engagement with the fungus, and getting a novel source of nitrogen through its engagement with bacteria. And if we look out in natural ecosystems, many plants, many, many plants are highly reliant on these microbial associations in order to support their nutrition. Now, the aspiration for my work uh, and, and our vision for going forwards is to maximize the utilization of this uh, fungal association, but also to transfer that ability to fix nitrogen, currently limited to legumes, to expand it into a much broader group of the plant kingdom uh, and allow, uh, in particular, our cereal crops to fix their own nitrogen, making them completely independent of inorganic fertilizers, uh, providing a much more sustainable way to produce our food and to drive up pr uh, food production. So in, when I, I would say I started this work when I was a postdoc at Stanford University, which was about uh, 25 years ago. And back then, we were really just trying to understand how legumes engage with nitrogen fixation. And you can't do an engineering problem or solve an engineering problem of this complexity until you know how your model plan does it. So we have to understand how a legume can engage with nitrogen fixing bacteria before we have the ability to use that knowledge to move it forwards into uh, driving up uh, the sustainability of our food production systems. And when I started uh, back uh, many years in Stanford, we were undertaking what we call a genetic dissection of that process. Uh, simply put, we we screen a very large uh, population of a legume that's been mutagenized, randomly mutagenized, that causes random mutations in its genome, randomly knocking out gene functions. And we screen that large population for plants that look like this. So this is a mutant plant where the black bar indicates where we've applied bacteria. Uh, and you can see, as compared to a wild-type plant, so that's the normal plant, it, when you apply the bacteria, it makes nodules at that point, uh, and the plant then can accommodate the bacteria inside those nodules. In contrast, this mutant is completely unable to engage with the bacteria. It behaves as if the bacteria are not there and, and doesn't make nodules. And then we go through, a, back then, a very involved process of discovering what that gene is that's been mutated. And then we reiterate that and reiterate it until we start to discover all of the genes in legumes that underpin this process of allowing them to gauge with nitrogen fixing bacteria. So it's actually by the removal of that gene function through mutagenesis that allows us to discover that gene uh, and, and then uh, uh, infer its function in, uh, in that uh, supporting that bacterial association. 
Now, that, that genetic dissection allowed us to describe what we call a signal transduction pathway. We call it the symbiosis signaling pathway, that allow, which is, involves a receptors sitting on, out in the root surface that are, that are able to perceive a chemical signal coming from the bacteria, from the nitrogen-fixing bacteria, these rhizobial bacteria in the soil, produce a chemical signal that the plant can recognize and recognizes it through this complex of receptors it then transmits that information into the nucleus of the cell uh, where it activates calcium oscillations uh, within the nucleus that is ultimately decoded by this calcium decoding complex. Now, central to this signaling pathway are these oscillations in calcium. And I show you a movie here of cells on the surface of a root that in a minute will start to respond to this bacterial signal that we've applied by oscillating the calcium in their nuclei. And that is essentially the signal transduction process happening uh, 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 um, allowing the record, transmitting that information, saying, telling the plant, the plant cells, I've recognized the chemical signal from the bacteria, it's transmitted into the nucleus, activates these calcium oscillations, and then a, a, a complex of proteins is able to recognize those calcium oscillations and turns on gene expression that's necessary to accommodate those bacteria. Now, this signal transduction pathway we discovered because, as I described, we mutated genes in legumes and uh, we discovered because it, uh, the, that mutations abolished the interaction with bacteria. But in fact, that signal transduction pathway was not only required for the engagement with nitrogen-fixing bacteria, it's also required for the engagement with the beneficial fungus. And we can show you that. Here's, this is now not a legume, this is barley that's been mutated for many components of the symbiosis signaling pathway. And you can see when we, this is using gene editing, when we knock out those gene functions, they completely abolish the plant's engagement with this is the beneficial fungus, the arbuscular mycorrhizal fungus. In wild type, we see extensive colonization of the root by the fungus. In these plants that are mutated in these genes, uh, it, it abolishes that engagement with the fungus. So while we discovered this signal transduction pathway in legumes, we actually could observe that the signal transduction pathway is very widespread in the plant kingdom, and in fact is functioning in the uh, facilitation, not just of the engagement with the beneficial bacteria, but also with the engagement with the beneficial fungus. What's more, you can see that barley is able to activate those calcium oscillations in its nucleus in response to a range of signaling molecules that come from the fungus, but also the signaling molecules that come from the nitrogen-fixing bacteria. So this is a signaling molecule from a bacteria called Cyanorhizobia melaloti that fixes nitrogen uh, in association with alfalfa. Uh, uh, this is a different nitrogen-fixing bacteria that fixes uh, bacteria, nitrogen-fixing bacteria that fixes nitrogen in association with lotus. A, a different species of legume. But you can see that barley is able to perceive these signaling molecules and activate the, those calcium oscillations in a manner that we see comparable to what we see in the legume. So essentially, when nitrogen fixation evolved here about 100 million years ago in, uh, in the angiosperms, it didn't start from scratch it utilized pre-existing processes that were already present in those progenitors to the legumes. And in fact, it was using a signal transduction pathway that didn't evolve at this point in the evolution of plants. It actually evolved all the way down here, right at the base of the land plants associated with the recognition of these beneficial fungi. And this is a common feature of evolution. Why reinvent the wheel when you've got a perfectly good signal transduction pathway that allows recognition of microorganisms out in the soil is it not is much easier to evolve novelty by you pre utilizing those pre-existing signaling pathways? So essentially what that's telling us is that all of our crops, or pretty well the majority of our crops, have this innate ability to recognize nitrogen-fixing bacteria. They possess, we've shown it for rice, we've shown it for maize, we've shown it for wheat, but we can infer from that it's also true for, for crops of real importance to smallholder farmers like cassava and sorghum, that all of these crops have this 
unrecognized ability to uh, associate or potentially uh, associate with nitrogen fixing bacteria. So they have the signal transduction machinery that allows recognition of nitrogen fixing bacteria, but they're not engaging with nitrogen fixing bacteria. These crops are not producing these nodules, they're not proactively engaging, they're not capable of that process of nitrogen fixing bacteria, even though they have the signal transduction pathway that at least in legumes underpins that process of, of, of engaging with nitrogen fixing bacteria. So when the when when legumes recognize nitrogen fixing bacteria at the surface using the signal transduction pathway, they then activate this developmental process producing the formation of these nodules. And we know that in, in, the, in our cereal crops, they're absolutely not doing that. They may be recognizing some of these signaling molecules from the bacteria, but they're unable to activate the developmental processes. So there's a key evolutionary step in the legumes that has been this process of making a nodule and, and the, developmental associate, uh, the developmental processes that end, underpin that nodule development. Uh, and we've been for a number of years now, again, dissecting that process using genetics to understand the, now here's the developmental sequences and the genes that are involved that underpin the production of this nodule in multiple stages, initiating root organogenesis, giving that root organogenesis a very specific identity, the nodule, and ultimately the proposed processes that lead to what we call the nodule maturation, which is creating the environment to support nitrogen fixation. Now, all of these genes that we've discovered that are in underpinning this process of nodule development, again, the same story. There's nothing novel in a legume. In fact, in 25 years of genetic dissection, we haven't found a single gene in nitrogen fixation that is unique to legumes. Every single gene that we've discovered is already present in all, in all plants, uh, or in, certainly present in most plants. So what's happened during the evolution of nodulation is that the plant has used pre-existing processes. It's like a pick and mix. You take this the sweet from over here, you take this bit from over here, and it's a unique re-networking of that process as opposed to an evolution of anything from scratch. Now, when we're thinking about engineering a novel process in a cereal crop like nitrogen fixation, far, far easier to re-network these processes and build something that from these signal transduction pathways or developmental processes that already exist in our target crops, much easier to engineer a re-networking of that than to be building all of that from scratch. Uh, and so from an engineering perspective, it tells us that, in fact, it's actually much easier than certainly we originally, certainly what I thought 25 years ago when I started to, un to work in nitrogen fixation, we're not having to build anything from scratch. We're actually re-networking pre-existing developmental processes and creating novelty by that re-networking, by uh, uh, expressing these different processes in a novel way to create that novel development. But there is actually nothing intrinsically novel about the process of nitrogen fixation. Now, as a result of that knowledge, we're able now to engineer nodule-like structures on our cereal crops. These are nodule-like structures we've engineered into barley, uh, using that ba basic knowledge uh, from cereals. So we can certainly drive the developmental processes that are common in legumes and, and recapitulate some of that development in our cereal crops. But ultimately, the real most important step is getting bacteria into those nodules. It's no point having no developmental structures on your roots. That's not, it's useless. If you don't get bacteria into those structures, you're not fixing nitrogen. And this process of uh, the uh, colonization of the root by the bacteria, I would say at the moment is the point that we really do not fully understand how that process happens. Uh, and, and that right now is our number one focus, understanding how the plant gets colonized by the bacteria in order to now be able to transfer that bacterial colonization into these nodule-like structures that we've been able to engineer in our cereal crops. So that's where we, we, we stand at the moment. 
I, I haven't been able to talk about our work on the arbuscular mycorrhizal symbiosis, but we, we certainly have a lot of uh, developments there, which I think is going to be useful. But ultimately, our big aspiration is to get nitrogen fixation in cereals. We're not there yet. It remains a, 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 a something of a moonshot project. But I feel like the, the knowledge that we've been gaining as we've been moving along this track is telling us it's possible. I'm very confident it's possible. Uh, and I'm hopeful that in, within the, maybe within the next decade, we'll, we'll be, able to, uh, be able to come here and tell you about having nitrogen fixing cereals we see. Now, what I've been talking about and what my research has focused, focuses on is mutualistic associations. These are associations which, where both, both organisms benefit, the plant benefits and the microorganism benefits. And they, the, uh, these organisms are engaging in a constructive way that is, that is mutually beneficial to both partners. And I think that that's a really nice analogy for the, the process of science and how we do science. I, I, I love science uh, and I'm inspired by science and I find it very exciting. And I actually personally find science an extraordinarily creative process. I don't buy this, uh, this, uh, this uh, idea that oh, creativity is limited to the arts. It's not at all. When you're having to discover something you don't understand, you have to bring a huge amount of creativity into that process. And I believe, I, for, certainly for myself, I am most creative when I'm in environments where I feel particularly safe. And, you know, what, I think what we really suffer in the sciences is we have very poor representation from diversity. It's intrinsic to the sciences. We are very male-dominated, we are very white, and we're very heterosexual in the sciences. We, we talk a lot about diversity, but actually when you look at the sciences, we are very backward compared to many other industries uh, in our society. Science is not a particularly diverse environment currently. And yet, we know that diverse environments it are the environments that, create, that facilitate creativity. And they're actually the more diverse environments and more productive environments. And I think in many ways, the reason that diversity is so valuable is because it allows authenticity. For myself, I am most creative when I feel comfortable to be fully authentic and, and, and able to express the full complexity of the person that I am. That is, that is the, the process that facilitates creativity uh, and allows this uh, sort of creative and uh, explorative environment that is intrinsic to, the, to how we do science and to being successful as scientists. So, very often when we present, and, and Jennifer presented a, a, a form of this, we often present this long list of, uh, of diplomas and awards and successes. That's all we hear about when we're in academia, that laundry list of awards of, that says I'm worthy and you should pay attention to me. And we build this sort of persona of success in part to be respected, in part to be valued, to be, to be believed. It, it says this person is important, you should be paying attention. But it hides behind, it hides a facade, it presents a facade of me just jumping from success to success to success and living this wonderful, happy existence. And it very much hides other aspects of myself and other aspects. And in addition to being a scientist, I'm also a gay person. I uh, identify as non-binary. My pronouns are he, they. Consider myself queer. I've been married to my husband for 17 years and with him for 27 years, and I'm a bio dad to a son and daughter. And that is a sort of information that rarely gets out there. It's very, uh, uh, and certainly as a, as a member of the LGBT community, I could have stood up here for the whole hour of my talk and you wouldn't know unless I said so. I have to actually say I'm gay. I have to actually say I'm non-binary in order to make to, 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 to be there. And I happen to be one of the first openly gay fellows of the Royal Society. Don't actually know National Academy of Sciences. I, I joined just last year. I, I'm not aware of how, how many members of the National Academy are LGBT, but 
surprisingly, is a very small number of us in the senior science community that are at least open about our sexuality uh, uh, and explicit in, in talking about it. I love my husband very dearly, and I've been with him, as I said, for nearly 27 years now, and he has really been by my side my whole time, working, helping me through the many challenges that I face and, and the, the difficulties that sometimes you deal with in academia uh, and in the professional world. And as a person, it shouldn't matter. It shouldn't matter, it really shouldn't matter that I, that I, I, I live with a man as opposed to a woman. But it has mattered a huge amount. It's mattered a lot in my life, and it certainly impacted an awful lot about the person that I am and the way I work as a scientist and the way, the way I have functioned in the scientific environment. When I was growing up, it was particularly difficult to be a member of the LGBT community. I'm presenting, these are some uh, newspaper quotes from newspapers uh, in the UK. These are some mainstream newspapers in the UK. And these are some quotes when I was a kid um, that are uh, pretty uh, uh, negative, I would say, even uh, suggesting that I should be jailed or locked away or even just die, uh, simply cease to exist because of my sexual identity not a, a very supportive or a facilitating environment for a, uh, a young uh, homosexual to grow up. And in, in the UK, we also had, in Mar Margaret Thatcher's government, brought in what we called Section 28, which meant that schools who controlled local authorities were unable to promote homosexuality, which meant that when I was a, a kid growing up in quite toxic environment for uh, LGBT community, nobody in my school could support me. Nobody could reach out a helping hand. Nobody could say anything positive about homosexuality. It, it meant that actually nothing was said. It was, it was uh, uh, at least the teachers took no position whatsoever. They weren't able to. They were legally bound to say nothing. And I was bullied a lot at school. Um, and it's very common experience for members of the LGBT community to experience an awful lot of bullying and an awful, awful lot of prejudice, particularly when they're growing up. And the, the effect of, all, of that negativity and growing up in an environment where you really feel you have to suppress your identity, it creates a sense of shame. And, and this is something that Alan Downs so very clearly presented in this book, The Velvet Rage. Shame underpins our existence in the LGBT community, something we carry around all the time. It's a baggage that we bring to all situations. And in particular, I would say it's a baggage that I brought very much to my professional world uh, uh, and the professional world. When you carry that kind of baggage, you come to academia and I work super hard to achieve all of those accolades and to get the awards and to get the recognition because it covers that shame. It, 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 it's a way of avoiding the shame. I can simply go into academia and jump from those successes and successes and do something that I was really good at. I mean, I love science and I'm, and I'm good at science. Uh, and I'm not saying I was successful at science because I was an, uh, carried the shame of being a, a, a member of the LGBT community. But I think it's a massive driver. And I think it's something about being a minority and growing up a minority we come with a degree of baggage. We're not, we're, we, 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 there's a degree of understanding that's necessary in order to really facilitate uh, the inclusivity of the LGBT commu community, but more broadly, I think, uh, minorities as a whole. I came out when I was 20, and I'm probably the first generation of scientists who have been out my entire professional life. Um, I, I, ever since I've worked in a lab, I've been open about my sexuality. And it is a very liberating experience to, to be honest to yourself and to the people around you that you're a, a, a member of the queer community. But it doesn't eradicate the shame. It's something that is a lifetime journey to really full, become fully accepting and uh, positive about my sexuality. Uh, that is something that I, uh, I continue to work with. 
And when you get to a professional world, and this is probably true for many professional worlds, but I think it's particularly true in science and academia, you work so hard to get that respect on the, on the academic side, and then you live this additional life, your LGBT life, your queer existence, and it does feel like you have a Janus existence, your personal life and your professional life. And it's not surprising that many people in my community, my, the LGBT community, choose to not talk about this aspect of their life in the professional world, because they fear the ramifications of doing so. They fear what, other, what it means that people will think about them when they're then standing up on a podium like this and talking about their science and talking about something that's important to, to the audience. And certainly something that I've experienced as an LGBT minority, very, very difficult to thrive in an alpha male dominated world. So many of our worlds and academics, academia and outside of academia, we have a perception of leadership that really is this perception of a sort of alpha male, a very dominating figure, very controlling, not particularly compassionate, but demand, very demanding of outputs. Uh, another way to present that maybe, and a different way of my experience of that alpha male world, it can be a very aggressive world. And that's fine if you've grown up as a very confident individual. If you're coming to the world as a minority, this very aggressive, macho world attacking each other, it's very scarring. It's not the sort of environment that supports diversity, and it certainly isn't the sort of environment that supports uh, members of my community, the LGBT community. At its most minor, I think it drives conformity, and I spent a large part of my career trying to conform to what I thought was a successful scientist and suppressing my minority status. At its worst, it encourages an environment of harassment uh, and discrimination, uh, as something that I have experienced in my professional world that is very uh, 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 undermining of one's confidence and creativity. My experience of queer spaces, what we consider queer spaces, is really the polar opposite of that. These are environments which really are there to be supportive, to understand difference, to facilitate difference, and to celebrate difference. It's, it's almost the polar opposite to this alpha male-dominated existence. And I think that actually this is something that we in the, in the LGBT community can actually bring to the professional world. It's our gift to academia, it's our gift to the professional world. What we bring is a real acceptance and understanding of the complexity of the human existence. And I think what the LGBT community can bring to a professional space, they move the boundaries of what is acceptable and they allow everybody to find their comfort point within that much broader expression of uh, human existence. Some, something that was really missing in my world was role models. The only scientist I knew growing up who was gay and in fact, probably still the only famous gay scientist that anybody can identify is Alan Turing. Uh, Alan Turing, if you don't know, was a pioneer. He invented the computer. He formed, provided the foundations of artificial intelligence. And he broke the Enigma code in the Second World War, which was a code that Nazi Germany was using uh, to, to, to send their messages. And he really both through his, he opened up a whole field of research, but he changed the course of history by using that research. One of the most important British scientists we've ever had. And yet when he was discovered that he was homosexual, he was chemically castrated by the state, a barbaric act. And then within a year of that, he committed suicide. He was dead by the age of 42. Now, if it wasn't for that act, Alan Turing would have been alive when I was alive. He would have been the living role model for LGBT queer scientists and a demonstration that you can actually contribute as a queer person. Uh, and I, I spent a long time coming to terms with um, Alan as a role model and understanding Alan. Uh, I now consider him a, a queer pioneer 
he was too honest before his time, uh, unfortunately. But I think it's very important that those of us who are uh, LGBT members of the science community, we don't just hide our identity. I think it's really important that we step, step up and act as role models and identify uh, in the community. It's something that I've been doing uh, proactively now for a number of years. Here I am marching uh, in the London Gay Pride with the Royal Society of Biology. And I think it's just very important, not just for the LGBT community, but for science as a whole to recognize that we, that there are minorities in science, we contribute a lot to science. And in fact, I think we've got a genuine gift to give to science and to give to the world that uh, allows a, a freer expression of the human form and creates an environment where, where that facilitates that creative exploration by simply allowing everybody, not just ourselves, but everybody else to feel more authentically themselves and to express themselves more fully. So my recommendations for, as a minority, as a very rare minority in the sciences, is firstly, we have to celebrate the science, the diversity that we have. It's really important that we're out there and, and, and celebrating that diversity. It's important to promote that diversity by actively speaking about diversity. For 20 years as a queer scientist, I, never, I did not work in a space where lesbian, gay, bisexual was ever mentioned. 20 years of my professional world to hear those words in a professional context. That's super important that we feel that we hear our minority status and we feel welcomed into, the, into those environments. It's important to support, recognize that many minorities come with baggage, and I don't only speak for the LGBT community, many minorities come to the world having experienced a challenging environment. And we come with a baggage, so support, support for staff uh, and well-being groups is really important for minorities. And I think it's really important, as I'm doing right now, to be very open about our minority status, to not hide away and pretend that we're something that we're not. Uh, it's very important we call out harassment when we see it, both for ourselves and for others. But I think most importantly, it's about being yourself. Uniqueness is valuable. We tend to always try to conform. I say the opposite. Everyone's uniqueness that you bring to the world is valuable and is valuable to the, the, the professional environment in which you work. So I'm just going to end with the planet Earth again. I do think we in science have an enormous amount to contribute, especially I think we need science now more than ever and looking forward to the challenges that we face on this planet, I'm not seeing, I can't say I have a lot of confidence in politicians addressing those problems alone. I think we're going to have to find technological solutions to some of these astronomical uh, challenges that we face. And if we're going to have the truly aspirational discovery science that we need to solve those problems, it's important that we welcome everybody into our scientific community and create environments where uh, science can thrive and create, creativity can be fully recognized. And thank you very much. Mm.